Welcome to NARAL's The Morning After. Each week, our podcast brings you the latest on reproductive health care, progressive politics, and the fight to keep abortion safe and legal. You can listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube, and on our website at ProChoiceOhio.org. The program also airs each Friday morning at 9 on WGRN 94.1 in Columbus, Ohio. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ProChoiceOH. NARAL's The Morning After is a production of NARAL ProChoice Ohio. Enjoy the show! This is Kelly Freeman. This week, our own Jamie Miracle sat down with Elizabeth Brown, Executive Director of the Women's Public Policy Network. They discussed a provision in the state budget that uses taxpayer funding to operate fake women's health centers. That's right. Your tax dollars are funding deceptive, anti-choice health clinics, sometimes known as crisis pregnancy centers. These groups are infamous for giving misleading and medically inaccurate information to pregnant patients seeking care. Today's podcast audio is courtesy of the Women's Public Policy Network. While you're listening to this week's show, be sure to check out our events tab on our Facebook page. On October 3rd at the Hilltop branch of the Columbus Metropolitan Library, NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio is co-hosting a town hall. Together with the Kaleidoscope Youth Center and Columbus DSA, you'll be able to meet state legislators from Franklin County and talk about the full spectrum of reproductive health care from abortion to better birth outcomes to child care, charter schools, and parenting LGBTQIA plus youth. Child care is available at this event. For more details, go to facebook.com slash NARAL Pro Choice Ohio and click on events or find a link in the show notes. So that's all for me. Enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Um, I'm Elizabeth Brown. I'm the executive director of the Ohio Women's Public Policy Network. And you are joining us today for our third of our three part series, Breaking Down the State Budget. Um, we are joined by one of really the gurus of the legislature. When it comes to women's issues, I always ask Jamie <laughs> <laughs> to help me decipher what's going on because um, things move so quickly in the legislature and especially during budget season. Um, WPPN just released our post-budget analysis earlier this month to break down how the budget works for women in the state of Ohio. Um, so we've talked about health care um, on uh, our panel last week, and week before that we talked about um, child care and the earned income tax credit. Today we're talking about um, name mostly um, abortion and, um, and access to care for women. Um, we are joined by Jamie Miracle. Um, Jamie is with NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio, and before we launch into the budget, could you tell us, Jamie, a little bit more about what NARAL does in Ohio, um, and specifically um, how NARAL fights for women? Certainly. So NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio is one of the leaders in making sure that abortion access and reproductive health access stays accessible to those in Ohio. We have offices in Columbus and Cleveland, and we do work across the state, even in places where we don't have offices. My organizer last week was told that they thought that she lived in D Dayton because she's spending so much time there. <laughs> but um, So we do work across the state, Toledo, Dayton, Cincinnati, everywhere. Um, really working through policy work, research, grassroots organizing, and um, focusing a lot on our six independent abortion providers across the state um, to make sure that we're doing all we can to support them. For example, in Dayton right now, we're working a campaign to make sure that the hospital there knows how critical it is for them to sign a transfer agreement with the last clinic to keep it open. So you know, we really um, work to make sure that abortion access um, is, is safe and legal in our state. Great. Well, thank you. So, um, as is evident, NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio has been really at the forefront of the fight for abortion access and reproductive rights in Ohio for decades. Um, but one of the emerging threats over the last few years um, when it comes to reproductive health care access and abortion access is the prominence of um, so-called crisis pregnancy centers. And I have to admit, I hate that name. Um, I just want to call them fake health clinics. Mm -hmm. Um, to be quite honest, um, so but we call them crisis pregnancy centers, shortened to CPCs, um, uh, just for ease there. And could you tell us what what they are? Just yeah. break it down. What are they? I mean, you summed it up perfectly. They are fake health centers. Um, they um, most offer absolutely no health services. Some of them offer some very limited STD screening. Um, 
they all call themselves health clinics because they'll hand you a drugstore pregnancy test and show you where the bathroom is. Um, that is the extent of most of their healthcare services. Um, many are religiously affiliated, um, so um, but don't usually um, advertise that to the people coming for, for services there, and all have the goal of coercing individuals out of making a decision to have an abortion um, when facing an unintended pregnancy. Many years ago, we did a secret shopper study of these centers and found um, that like, less than half of them um, admitted their anti-abortion bias to the client seeking care. 60% didn't disclose that they weren't a healthcare center. And beyond the fact that they're, you know, advertising in a healthcare center and, you know, healthcare provision kind of points of view, they also, because they're not healthcare centers, aren't governed by HIPAA to keep your information yeah. private and all of that stuff too. So it even goes to a different level there. Um, in one case, actually, a researcher reported back that they were sitting at the center that was directly across the street from the Planned Parenthood here in Columbus on East Main. And when you're sitting in that waiting room, you can actually see the Planned Parenthood across the street. And somebody else in the waiting room asked, hey, do you know where the closest place is that I could go get birth control? And the woman's like, I don't know. There's no Planned Parenthoods anywhere around here. And like you could literally see the building across the street um, from that spot. So that's another thing they very often do is set up directly across the street or next door to an abortion facility or an actual healthcare facility and try to um, get people to come in there instead. The campus health center that Planned Parenthood has too has a CPC right next door yeah. and you hit it before you hit the Planned Parenthood walking up from High Street. And they often say that people have gone into the CPC before going in. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's not just that truth is not prioritized at these centers. <laughs> it, really, they, they're based on deception yeah. at the front door, mm -hmm. right? And for exactly your point, you know, that they're positioned often in a way to try to um, divert women from accessing honest, real care. Yeah. And at the baseline, what we should ex expect in our health care is honesty from our providers. At yeah. the baseline, that's what we... That's, yeah, in fact. Yes, yeah. honesty in fact. And um, it's pretty, it's kind of un unbelievable that these exist. Um, and, and then we, we want to get to how the state has, frankly, perpetuated them. But mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about the dangers um, of, you know, for women in seeking medically accurate and unbiased information mm -hmm. when they visit one of these instead? And um, uh, something that has been sticking with me that you told me a couple months ago about the difference between um, the outcomes for pregnant women that visit a real health clinic mm -hmm. like Planned Parenthood versus um, the CPCs, that so much of the model behind a CPC is built around just kind of forget you're pregnant until it's too mm -hmm. late to have an abortion, that women don't seek prenatal care as quickly as they do when they're when they're going to a real clinic. So could yeah. you talk about what's at risk, mm -hmm. I guess? Uh, certainly. I mean, I think everyone should be able to agree the fact that when you're trying to make a decision about health care, whatever it is, that the information you're basing that decision on should be fact-based and culturally competent as we start looking at a lot of the racial disparities that exist in these healthcare um, outcomes. And so, you know, very often these centers, um, when trying to coerce you out of having an abortion, try to scare you into not having an abortion by um, talking about things like abortion causes breast cancer or abortion causes uh, mental illness or infertility. Um, all of these have been disproven by multiple medical studies, um, but are very commonly used at these centers to scare somebody out of, of having an abortion. And so, and also um, they talk a lot about miscarriage rates and overinflate a miscarriage rate kind of to, to insinuate that, well, you know, a quarter of all pregnancies or a third of all pregnancies will end in a miscarriage. You know, don't rush and have an abortion when you might just miscarry anyway. Um, so they really are based on delaying access to care so that they can, um, they can you know, stop you from making the decision. We actually had a person come to a sister organization recently that um, had gone to a CPC and was later in her pregnancy, but not past our gestational limit. So she could have still had an abortion, but this, the CPC told her she was a couple weeks further along than oh she God. was. And so she thought she couldn't get access to care. And it started a whole cascade of events that made her have to go out of state to get the, the abortion care that she needed. Yeah. So, you know, these are the types of situations that happen these in these yeah. centers. Yeah. 
Um, <coughs> so what happened in the state budget? Um, you know, there we have had state we have had state lawmakers, you know, over the course of many budgets, use the budget as a vehicle to restrict abortion access. Um, but you know, with this increasing trend of CPCs, they're they're incorporating, I guess, more tools mm -hmm. um, to to kind of come after women's health care. So, can you tell us what what happened this time? Yeah. So, as you say, I, I actually looked it up this morning. Um, they we've had 23 restrictions on abortion and other reproductive health care services since 2011. Um, 13 of those 23 came through state budgets. Wow. So um, this funding for crisis pregnancy centers and the budget is a piece of that. Um, and so what we saw is this was first introduced in the budget in 2013. And um, in 2015, it was actually funded for the first time as a line item at a million dollars a year. Um, we saw that renewed in 2017 at another million dollars per, actually per biennium, two years, over a two year period. This year, um, interestingly, the budget as introduced and as it passed the House had none of this funding. Um, mm -hmm. They were actually focused in the House on bipartisan um, solutions to actual problems people were facing. Um, so it wasn't until the Senate started looking at the budget yeah. that um, we saw this funding come in and Ohio Right to Life got what they were asking for, um, $5 million over the two year period. So two and a half million dollars a year for crisis pregnancy centers. Um, and so it went, of course, all budgets go to conference committee because nobody can agree on anything. Um, and interestingly, when it came back out of conference committee, that five million was seven and a half million. And it seemed really random, like why would they increase by another 2.5 million? Ohio Right to Life hadn't been asking for it. Nobody had been asking for this money. It wasn't until we continued our review of what had happened in the budget and realized that they had actually removed a $2.5 million allocation in the Medicaid budget that would have funded access to contraception, would have allowed Medicaid clinics to undergo a practice transformation so they could better serve patients coming to them for long-acting reversible contraceptives like IUDs and implants, to do compassionate, culturally sensitive counseling, and to do same-day insertions for somebody who wants it. Because if somebody has to come back for a second appointment, they're much less likely to get access to the care they need. Um, so um, they actually removed the $2.5 million for that program, and that's where that additional $2.5 million for crisis. So like directly the state of Ohio, the legislators in control of our, our state budget decided to take $2.5 million away from actual health care provision and put it into these fake clinics again. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was really the first huge time where you really saw, well, we really don't care yeah. about health care. We care about putting money into these centers and showing our political base that we support their anti-abortion agenda and that the anti-abortion agenda is more important than access to real health care in our state. Yeah, we should we should <coughs> all be able to, I think, reasonably agree around <laughs> wanting to reduce the rates of unintended pregnancies. I, I think that should be something that people on all sides of um, viewpoints on abortion access should agree. but. This 7.5 million that came in, you know, out of the state budget, kind of demonstrates we can't all agree on that. Mm -hmm. It's real. That's really astounding. That 2.5 million yeah. from Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, and these centers do nothing to prevent. Re so when we did our study, yeah. we actually had a series of scenarios that the researcher went in on. And the first one was they took a pregnancy test and it came back negative, and they had a conversation about what kind of birth control they could get access to, and. Almost universally, it was just don't have sex. There was no access to oral contraceptives or even a referral to a doctor who could prescribe birth control. It was abstinence is the only way you should just really be abstinent. So, you know, again, these centers don't provide that kind of care at all. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So, out of the state budget, this was a pretty appalling um, allocation of money done in the name of all Ohioans. But um, <laughs> um, but Nayral, you know, you are you have your eye on um, the the full gamut of reproductive health um, access and um, trying to increase access. Um, 
What are the other reproductive health fights that we need to keep our eye mm -hmm. on? You know, where, where else might we um, see restrictions coming, um, need to push back on restrictions, or where can we champion um, some sort of proactive increased access? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a couple of kind of proactive things. I mean, when you look at where this money could have gone, it could have gone into increased child care subsidies. Ohio has the worst, um, um, the, it's the hardest in Ohio to get into the child care subsidies program in our state. So we could increase access to those child care subsidies. We could increase housing um, support for low-income families because having safe, stable housing and safe communities is integral to families being health and safe um, and safe, healthy and safe. Um, and we could support organizations like we have in Columbus, Root to Restoring Our Own Through Transformation, or Birthing Beautiful Communities in Cleveland to actually provide health care to the communities most impacted. I think one of the biggest like aha moments in this whole fight on the CPC funding was State Representative Erica Crowley questioned one of the directors um, of one of these centers about um, the cultural competency training that their practitioners and the volunteers and the workers in their centers get. And the director didn't even really understand the question beyond not having any cultural sensitivity. You know, training with their staff didn't really even understand how providing culturally competent care could reduce the racial disparities in healthcare when it comes to infant and maternal mortality. So really looking at funding those kinds of programs is something else that, that the state really could look at. But when we look at this funding and kind of the continued attacks, what we see is this, it's almost an attack on the truth. I think we're seeing it at yeah. the federal yeah. level and the state level on a bunch of different issues, climate change, all of those things. And the fact that, you know, we've got this funding, $7.5 million to lie to and mislead people looking for health care. We have um, Representative Becker's bill where he just wildly claims you can move a, um, ectopic pregnancy into the uterus. Um, you have, and that bill also bans all insurance coverage for birth control and abortion care. And because of his definition of ectopic pregnancy treatment would actually ban insurance coverage for ectopic tre pregnancy treatment wow. in the state. And then just last week, they had sponsored testimony on Senate Bill 155. It's a Peggy Laner bill that um, would require abortion providers to give completely medically unbased, <laughs> not based on any kind of scientific fact or medical evidence that a, a medication abortion can be reversed. Yeah. After um, the patient takes the first pill, um, which has no scientific backing, has no been no studies. Um, we, we did a town hall with um, Representative Russo last week, and she called it the um, Experimenting on Pregnant Women Act. Yeah. Because that is what this yeah. bill is. It's yeah. encouraging doctors to experiment on pregnant women without any efficacy data or data that it's not dangerous. I mean, yeah. this could be dangerous to the, to the pregnant person, too. So um, we've got that one, and then... Um, and also can't forget about House Bill 90, Representative Antani's bill to require fetal development curriculum standards for our public schools um, to achieve an abortion-free society. So that's not biased at all whatsoever. Um, and again, what we should be teaching our schools, you know, in our public schools should be fact-based and unbiased information so students can learn how to make their own kind of policy statements and positions on these things rather than being force-fed an agenda from the state legislature, especially in a state that has absolutely no health education standards. So like our health classes aren't governed by a state education standard because our state legislators are so scared about talking about sex ed in our schools. So yeah, it's, it's, it really, when you really look at kind of all of these bills that were, are still kind of coming down the pike, it really is just this continued obsession with misinformation and, you know, Kind of being devoid of, of evidence and fact. It, it, you know, it's pretty, <clears throat> there are two things you said um, that are really sticking with me. Um, the dangers to women's health of, of this agenda, I mean, real dangers to women's health of this agenda being pursued when, um, you know, ectopic pregnancies are a life-threatening condition for a woman. Mm -hmm. If you have an ectopic pregnancy, it is life-threatening. So to play games with how that should be treated to do that in our legend, you know, in the halls of the state house where we elect people to pass bills to help folks. I mean, that's that is mind blowing, mm -hmm. um, and it really, I think, underscores the fact that, um, in so many ways, women are sort of just used as a tool 
um, right now. And the, the health and bodies of women are being used as a tool in this ideological fight. Um, it, it can be really discouraging. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, especially in the ectopic pregnancy, I mean, what we saw when that story broke were women across the country talking about how hard it was to want to be pregnant and to lose a pregnancy in that way. And, you know, they were kind of caught almost in this false hope. Like he gave these people a thought of, wait, I could have saved that pregnancy. I could have had that child when that doesn't exist at all. So this whole, you know, again, just it really is playing not only with the physical health, but the emotional and mental health of women across the state, yeah. too. It's unconscionable. Mm -hmm. And I think you sense a lot of outrage <laughs> in our voices because when you, when you break it down in the way that we have been over the last 20 minutes, it is outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing that's really sticking with me that you said is about curriculum in our schools. You know, that we don't have health standards um, in our schools for curriculum that govern what kids need to learn. And um, so we are not, give, we, there's, there's no baseline for medically accurate information that has to be provided to kids in, um, in their classrooms. And first of all, that is the best way to reduce unintended pregnancies, um, is to provide medically accurate um, uh, education to our, to our kids. Um, but then also it was just we're not setting kids up to live their healthiest lives, mm -hmm. right? They're, um, we are leaving a lot on the table by not addressing this issue um, for the next generation. And again, as depressing and outrageous as that, that point is, I think it is a glimmer of something to fight for in the future. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you laying out the ways that people can help and, you know, to, to fight in the positive direction, not just push back on the crazy. Um, and any one of you watching right now, you live in a school district, you may have kids that go to schools, you may be you know, a former parent, your kids may be graduated, but you still know those school board members. Ask what's being taught in those schools and talk to your school board about making changes. Local districts have a lot of say. That is the one, I think, mm -hmm. bright, um, piece here. We should have statewide standards, but in the absence of them, our local districts have a ton of control, and each of you is part of a local district that can make some change. Um, so that is, you know, one one thing, mm -hmm. I think, on, on the positive that we can fight for. Yeah, and certainly don't assume you yeah. know what your, what your kids are. We were actually talking actually with yeah. Rep. Russo last week again at our town hall where she was talking about she got like a flyer home from school from one of our kids and that was when she realized, oh wait, this is what my kids are learning? And we've heard that story from a lot of our folks who assume that they live in a progressive community and they assume they know what their school is teaching their kids and they just don't. So ask questions and you really can make a difference because parents do have a, a strong voice in their schools. Yep. Well, um, thank you. Oh, oh, and we're gonna take audience questions. Um, I see that we have one, um, so Colleen's gonna read it to us. Um, so Patricia asks, what efforts are out there to inform women of the role our state legislators played in creating this problem? And how do we, uh, it seems like there's a disconnect between um, who's elected and what people, especially women, want. Mm -hmm. There certainly is a disconnect. Um, yes. There certainly is a disconnect. Do you want to um, offer anything first in answer to that, or do you want me to take it? I, I'll, I'll um, take some of that. I mean, certainly um, we get the word out on our social media channels. Check out Neural Pro Choice Ohio on Facebook or at Pro Choice OH on Twitter and Instagram. All of the hearings that we sit through are live tweeted with all that information. And now, actually, the House of Ohio House has announced that every single one of their House committees is being videoed, live streamed now, so you can actually watch this happen in the state legislature. But on the disconnect piece, I mean, that really goes to a much larger issue in our state and the fact that our state legislative districts are completely and totally gerrymandered so that your state le re legislator doesn't necessarily represent you in your community because they've drawn a district in a way to, to silence a lot of voters. So, you know, really paying attention to who you're voting, with, voting on and you know, paying attention to um, especially the Supreme State Supreme Court races too, really understanding who your candidates are and making sure those candidates share your values um, are two really critical ways to make sure your voice is being heard as we wait for the next redistricting um, process to happen and hopefully some fairer districts because of some changes that have been made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would underscore that to say that so much of 
the disconnect is about the structural democracy issues um, and the to connect the dots um, there is a there are state supreme court races um, next year that will be pivotal in deciding whether the lines our um, apportionment board and our um, our legislature draw for the legislative districts uh, are constitutional or not. So these Supreme Court races matter for a whole bunch of reasons, but if you're concerned about gerrymandering in Ohio, please pay attention. Um, another thing that matters to determine how districts are drawn is the census, which is also happening in 2020. So again, these are, you know, we want everyone to be counted, um, and the people who are not counted, um, one in five kids under five is not counted. Um, which is insane. They're the largest undercounted group. Um, and marginalized communities, people of color, um, lower income communities, the elderly are, are also often not counted. Um, so make sure that you're, you're getting yourself counted, you're empowering other people to make sure they're counted in the census. The census um, directly relates to the drawing of the lines. The Supreme Court is the watchdog for those lines. So those are some sort of structural democracy issues. And then there, there are the constant battles, as Jamie said, of like how to get this information and follow NARAL, um, follow what they're, what they're doing. They're great at getting information out about who, what legislators are fighting um, for healthcare access and reproductive care access for women and those who are standing in the way of it. Um, WPPN, the Ohio Women's Public Policy Network, um, we stay on top of these issues. We have a regular um, newsletter every week to help get out information about um, what's going on in this state and country when it comes to women's issues. So you can sign up for that on our website, which is, which is womenspublicpolicynetwork.org. Mm -hmm. um, and I, do we have any more questions? That, okay. Well, then I will sign off by doing two things. First, thanking Jamie Miracle for everything that she does to fight at the State House for abortion access and care for women. Um, and thank you for joining us today to help break this down. To find out more, um, again, this is the third in our three-part series on the state um, budget, but we published a full post-budget analysis, womenspublicpolicynetwork.org um, slash post hyphen budget. So go there to get the full breakdown. And, um, and please sign up if you want to get more information about additional offerings like this to break down what happens inside that state house um, and to get our regular newsletters. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in.